Hello, hello, hello. Don't think I'm getting any audio feedback, but that's okay, I guess. Hope everyone out there can hear me. Not a whole whole lot. It looks like I've got audio. Cool. <laughs> it's been a while. It's been a while, so... Things are uh, uncertain. I let my beard grow out way too much. So, here we are back. Ooh, how do you forget to capitalize stuff? So easy. Well, here we go. We're going to do some more philosophy roulette, number 238. I wonder when I'll get to 250. That's a good question. But... 238 philosophy papers read live on stream and that's what I do in philosophy roulette come we talk we discuss some philosophy you know we chat find out about stuff so this is the front page of Phil papers the preeminent place to find new research in philosophy we can go and hit journal articles Let's see what we got or Kentness, paradoxality, paradoxicality without paradox. Lucas Rosenblatt. Okay. I mean, it just doesn't seem like, you see, there's P-A-R-A-D-O-X, and it's P-A-R-A-D-O-X right there. So how do you do that? Very confusing. My, sentence, my senses couldn't always deceive me. Um, okay. And philosophy. Let's go take a look at this Arkentness. I doubt it's here, but we'll find out real fast. Hmm. Could always look at Arkentness. We like the uh, Arkentness is a great journal. Doesn't even exist. Okay, so it's too soon for it to even be up. Go look at philosophy. PPR: Practical Wisdom, Well-Being, and Success by Chen Hongzai. Chen Hongzai. Let's see. Huh. Are we available? Let's just see. Hey, Valpo, what's up? Oh, I wonder if we've got a glitch in um the DOI system. This is the second time it errored out. That's real interesting. I wonder if uh, Phil Papers has a uh, bug. See this? This is kind of interesting. I wonder if their uh, API has like broken or if the referring URL that the DOI system uses is broken. That's uh how are you doing Valpo? I hope you're having a good day. So let's see what else is coming up next. I mean we can look in uh these journals too. Let's just click there. Look in Philosophia. PPR never seems to have anything short enough for me to read on stream. I don't want to be going for like five hours. Phil Study sometimes has some short stuff. But yeah, let's see. Find it on Scholar. <sighs> Not so lucky. Correction 2. Interesting. You know, it was a uh, had some issues here. I had to move all my computers around a bit. It's been an interesting few weeks. Just because it's a phobia doesn't mean you shouldn't be afraid. Well, of course, like if you're on a really high thing, you might fall. You should be afraid of falling. It is dangerous. Um, let's click on it just because it's short. Presses of utopophobia and the limits of any political philosophy. All super short. You got the question marks right here. I don't know if you can see that, but... That is amazing, Valpo. Like, it is so hard to get your stuff, like, done, and then, like, if you get, uh, like, off track, getting back is, like, super important, so good on you. Uh, ooh. This is, a. Uh... Oh, it's a... Okay, this is a book review. Dagnabbit. I was like, how is this published like this? Okay, that's fine. 
Let's see, what else we got that's somewhat short enough? Graded epistemic justification. You know, I've decided I want to smack epistemologists, basically. There's some topics I've avoided because it just makes me angry. Epistemology is one of them. I'm tired of uh, being quietist about this, you know, because epi like, epistemology is terrible. Like, it's just terrible, and I don't want to, like, beat these people with a stick. You're just a third reader, so it's kind of a polit <laughs> kind of a politics philosophy thing. So getting all the parts lined up is a challenge. That is a very yeah. Um, there's the old joke of the two body problem. This is a three body problem, which is infinitely more difficult. And uh, yeah, <laughs> epistemologists are trouble. But let's click on this, and I'm just gonna be angry. But I'm already angry, so might as well be angry at somebody. Um, these uh, folks from ACU in Zurich. Let's see if it's available. Well, if you don't put your papers online, okay, it is available. This is Phil Studies. I don't think I've read a paper in Phil Studies in a while. Uh, all right, let's just see if it's uh, terrible and... Uh, Okay, there's not a ton of formulas. I was afraid for a second they were going to do like all this like logic y stuff. And I do not mind logic y stuff. I just mind it for reading on stream because uh, reading formulas on stream is terrible. So, this is what we look like we're going to get to do. We're going to do some graded epistemic justification, and I get to be grumpy. Now, the thing about indignancy is um, it's a cheap uh, emotion because you can just. It's like, it's free. You get to be, like, angry for free. It's like, I'm indignant. Ooh. And then you get to feel how you want to feel. So it's like, that's uh, a very cheap emotion. It's one of these modern things. Everyone's uh, aggrieved nowadays about something. It's like, oh, people are being dumb. But you know what? Uh, nope. This one. Let's get this a little loaded up so folks can know what's going on. You like Hawthorne? You know somebody named John Hawthorne? That's uh, exciting. Here's the link, and uh, anyone who comes a little late, you can always type exclamation point paper in the chat, and you will get the... Uh, the link will pop back up. So yeah, so here's the paper, and you can type a uh, explanation point uh, paper, and you can get the link back if you uh, just got here. So yeah, okay. Oh, Hawthorne, interesting. So we have someone who is known. <coughs> now, hey, Demarshall, what's up? How are you? Um, I hope everything is well with you. Uh, you're like two degrees from him on Kevin Bacon scale. I think some folks I knew in grad school worked with him. Looking good, looking good. Excellent, excellent. Well, two degrees of separation is actually really easy. It's probably only one in that case, but, um, yeah. I mean, I've, just being around philosophy, you end up being, yeah, a lot of stuff. But, uh, okay. Just because you met someone who met someone does not make them a good person. But we'll find out. <laughs> could be good. Could be good. Okay. So here we go. Yeah, and as always, uh, please feel free to ask me questions. The idea of uh, philosophy roulette is, um, you know, make a little game out of philosophy. We discuss the uh, arguments and the writing as we go. It is a, like... The world is big, but as soon as you narrow it down, it gets small real fast. Um, I've been away for a long time. Uh, the short story is I had some family issues that I'm probably not going to get into on stream. It's not like stream appropriate stuff, but it was significant enough that like <laughs> problems, problems, problems. So I'm okay, but like it just took up uh, time and, you know, mental space. Like streaming takes effort and it's like if uh, other things are more important, you just can't think. And uh, it's not like that is my job, so <laughs> it got dropped off, unfortunately, for two weeks or three weeks. Yeah, I mean, I'm sorry. I couldn't do it, but, like, it was just like, no, not happening. Oh. But I'm going to try to be back again, so here we go. Introduction. The adjective is justified. How the hell is that an adjective? 
An adjective is like yellow. Is justified is not an adjective. There's like two words here. Adjectives are like yellow. And like I said, I'm grumpy. Yeah, oh, me too. It's ongoing, unfortunately, tomorrow. So it's uh, significant enough that it's just uh, going to be chronic for a bit. So, um, the adjective... I feel less bad then. You thought you just kept missing me? No, I haven't streamed in weeks. Um, I mean, I have like popped into other people's streams, but that's because that takes massively less effort to uh, make snarky comments on other people's streams than it does to actually stream yourself. <laughs> but yeah, I have been around in a minor sense, but I haven't been streaming. Okay. The adjective is justifies has all the hallmarks of a gradable adjective. A gradable adjective. What the... F okay. And I am grumpy. So... And I've been working on Metafix, which makes me even more grumpy in my, like, spare whatever little time to distract myself I've had. But the relationship between gradable uses and straightforward predications of the form X is justified has been underexplored by epistemologists. In this paper, we undertake to do some ground clearing as a prelude to better understanding this relationship. Why the hell do anyone care about X is justified? Tell me, the only reason to care about X is justified is if you want to talk about justified true belief. No one gives, well, a lot of people give a crap about justified true belief, but the reason it's under underexplored by epistemologists is because it's not a good idea because we don't understand how justification at all works. So, this is, there's a reason it's underexplored is because we, it's just like laying ground for work for something we don't think is going to work to begin with. Thank you, Gettier. And Oh, I've got a bunch of people here now. Welcome. I'm just in a bad mood in general nowadays, and so I'm going to be screaming at some epistemology. Please feel free to ask questions. This is Graded Epistemic Justification by John Hawthorne and Arthur's Logins, and uh, type exclamation point paper, and you'll get a link to uh, the Phil Papers page. And you can just click on the uh, stuff, and you'll the, it's a open access paper. Okay, so... We're going to find out what... See, this is why this is a prelude to better understanding the relationship. The question is, why do we do that? I don't know. Evidence for gradability. Linguists use a variety of superficial tests for whether an adjective is gradable. Justified passes these tests with flying colors. Test 1. Admissibility of comparative constructions. For example, X is flatter than Y. X is more regrettable than Y. X is as regrettable as Y. Comparative uses of justified are not hard to find. Note that as most of the uses... Of justified in English concern actions, we, we shall freely make use of data from such uses. Okay, so what are we doing here? We are looking at their... Man, get your thing is hard for me, though. To be fair, you have to understand the sort of the mindset of people for the get your thing. The mindset of people for get your thing is they want to be able to say, hey, look, we got a lot of knowledge. They want to feel special. They want to feel like we know a ton of stuff, and we know it in a reasonable way, like it's easy to know stuff. They want to feel good about what they know about the world. That is not the case. And the reason is, is because, well, basically, you can separate being right for the wrong reasons and being wrong for the right reasons very, very easily. And so the idea that you're justified is what, like, kind of was backing them feeling good about themselves but you can be justified for the wrong reasons and still be right or you can be justified for the right reasons and still be wrong yeah f and chat for gettier well no f and Ch no get your rules f and chat for justified true belief <sighs> like it should be dead and we can pay our respects and just like let it go okay but yeah, alright, so basically what was going on here is we're going to like talk about uh, what they want. This is what you I would call a strategic diff. Oh, he died like a month ago? Oh, that's right. That's right. F and chat is for Gettier. <laughs> yeah, DeMarshall, it's uh, worth a laugh. You laugh so you don't cry. No, he died. In he did die like a month ago. Um, yeah, so we miss Gettier. But, uh, and I love the fact that like he published nothing else. He just did the one thing and it was just like, yeah, I'm done. I did all I need to do. Blow up epistemology. So, yeah, in terms of writing, what are we doing here? This is what I would call strategic defining. Is uh, And you find this term other places. Yeah, Gettier is a legend. He was up in uh, Massachusetts, UMass. He just sort of, like, chilled. It was cool. 
And so what they're doing here is they're going to set things up the way they want to so that you can they get what they want in terms of what's happening later. So this is like they're not actually going to be saying anything. They're just defining stuff like what's the test they like to show that this is gradable. And they're going to show it passes the test. And if they didn't want to do that, they could have done something else. But whatever. All right, so comparative uses of justified are not hard to find. Most of uses just find English concern actions. We shall freely make use of data from such uses. So yeah, they're just make, picking and choosing things they like. I doubt they're going to uh, pick ones that they don't like. But what, what are you going to do? One, but the film's real triumph lies in the fact that the range effects wear off, meaning bashing your friend's brains in isn't quite as justified as it usually is in zombie movies, at least not at first. Uh, rage effects wear off. I said range. Okay. Over goes Radic Rakitic, and the red card that follows is justified as the challenge was futile and brainless. Three prosecutors and judges for years have meted out punishment based on a view of, about how people work and how the world works that is justified as an argument that a doctor shouldn't wash his hands before handling a patient. As justified as. Okay. So you can do things like yes. You can do more justified, less justified, as justified. So, cool. Test two, felicity of how F questions. How tall is she? How flat is it? Questions of the form, how justified is, was, X are similarly, similarly not hard to find. But how justified were fan fears that Leeds would be starting the new season with a new man in the dugout for the eighth year in a row? How justified is Modi's new title? Okay, so the fact that... Okay. Uh, let's keep going. I can complain. Like, the structure of, like, how questions, it's like the fact that you can ask a, a how question is not particularly hard. Um, like, how does something feel? That's not an adjective, I guess. Like, you, like or how did it look? You can talk about that and be like, well, it looked healthy. I guess it's adjectives. But, like, so it's an adjective. Like, okay. And the question is, well, what is the uh, opposing sort of thing? Things that do not get graded. Things that are just one way or not. Like, um, that'd be an ontology. Things that just exist as a one, not as a property that has gradations. So this shirt is yellow. That's a property. It can be more or less yellow. The fact that it's a shirt is not gradable. It either is a shirt or isn't a shirt. So that's it. But that's not an uh, adjective then. It's like, okay, but that's the nature of adjectives. I don't know of any, uh, I mean, does chat know of any, like, non-gradable adjectives? Dead or not dead? But, like, you can say that's an ontological state. Test three. Admissibility of degrees, degree modifiers. For example, X isn't flat at all. X is extremely regrettable. X is slightly wet. X is somewhat bent. Y is completely confident. Why did the author switch from X to Y right here? Many degree modifiers are completely felicitous for justified. Defense analyst David Perry of the Canadian Global Affairs Institute said those concerns are completely justified given the Trump administration's penchant for using whatever means necessary to get foreign countries to buy U.S. products. He also said the government would ride shotgun to ensure the 480 euro, 80 million euro contingency fund is not drawn on unless absolutely justified. What's more, that's perfectly justified by Spain's clout in Europe at the moment. Okay. Of course, not all degree modifiers are felicitously combined with justified. For example, X is slightly justified. X is very justified. X is almost justified are pretty marginal to our ear. See, this is what is weird to me. Your ear. I don't care about slightly justified. Like, in many contexts, slightly justified is be uh, way better than non-justified. Like, if you said something is slightly justified because the alternative is terrible, then it, it slightly justified is fine. It's just a matter of context. Because, um, like, it's very justified as compared to something that is not uh, less justified, or X is almost justified given the circumstances like maybe you're saying someone you know had to steal because their family was like starving and you could say well look we never talk about stealing as being justified but we're gonna say it's almost given like the circumstances that would be something people would say but like this is the real thing that annoys me i don't give a crap what your ear sounds like what things sound to your ear like i just don't like whose intuitions are we going by here these all sound fine to me giving certain 
uh, contexts. But it is common even for a paradigmatic gradable adjectives to be somewhat choosy about which degree modifiers they admit. Of course, one would ultimately like to know whether there are deep reasons for the infelicity of certain combinations. We will not get to the bottom of that issue here. Yeah, sure. Tallness and justification. Oh dear, we're going to talk about how tall things are now. For, maybe, for many gradable adjectives, it is very natural to model them in, a, in the following way. They are associated with a certain scale, in, and in context, a threshold on the scale is imposed. This model is, for example, extremely natural for tall. In context, tall is associated with a threshold on the scale of heights. Adjectives for which such a model is appropriate are what Peter Unger and Chris Kennedy, following Unger, call relative gradable adjectives. It is clear enough that epistemologists who have discussed the relationship between justification and degrees of justification have been conceiving of justification on the model of a relative gradable adjective. Sometimes the imagined threshold is that of coherence, sometimes that of evidential support. But we do not wish to dwell on such choice points now. For now, we merely wish to draw attention to a key a key commonality, that models in play have a structure akin to those that are typically deployed for relative gradable adjectives. Something like the threshold model is in play, or is the topic of, the following remarks. A belief system is justified if it is coherent to a sufficiently high degree. That this, in essence, is Lawrence Bonjour's solution to the regress problem. 10. For any reasonable standard of justification or knowledge, there will be a point at which I just meet and do not exceed that standard, and again, assuming I am justified in believing her to be the better arithmetician, I will then not know or be justified in believing the proposition that if she says the sum is wrong, then she is wrong. 11. Compare Peter Klein's argument. This argument assumes, of course, that degree of justification should be understood as likelihood of truth and that there is a threshold of justification required for a belief to be considered justified. All right, so finally we're getting somewhere. But there are important differences between tall and justified that should not be ignored. In particular, justified has hallmarks of what Unger and Kennedy call absolute gradable ab adjectives, one which are more naturally associated with endpoints on a scale than thresholds on a scale. In this connection, it bears emphasis that one makes one of the standard tests for absolute gradable adjectives is susceptibility to modifiers like completely. It is unacceptable, unacceptable to combine such modifiers with tall. John is completely tall, is utterly infelicitous. Yeah, but like full. Okay, so if like John is completely full. Yeah, I mean, there's things with limits on it. So if we just use tall as opposed to full as opposed to tall, it would it seems completely okay. That's fine. However, the expression completely justified is altogether natural. Here's a second test from Kennedy. The negation of relative gradable adjectives does not imply their antonyms, while the negative of absolute gradable adjectives does. Not tall does not imply short, while not pure does imply impure. Okay. It is natural to think of justified as the antonym of justified... Uh, uh, think of unjustified as the antonym of justified, in which case this test places justified on the absolute side. Yeah, I mean, there's there's definitely, like, you got adjectives and then you get, like, past a limit on things. So, like, if you're just, like, even on the color scale, like, this can be yellow up into a limit, and then it's, like, completely yellow. But then you add some other colors to it and it becomes more orange, and then it's not completely uh, yellow anymore. So, like, you're not tall, like, you can't be completely tall, but you can be completely yellow. Uh, like as opposed to something else, on a certain understanding of what yellow amounts to in a numerical sense, because then it's like quantized. You can have like the pure, like red, green, blue, um, like color scheme. So I'm not entirely sure that the status of the completeness has more to do with an imposed um, scale than in the adjective itself. Like, when you're talking about justified, you could say completely justified or unjustified, but I'm saying maybe that has to do with the how we're understanding it. Like, yellow could be completely yellow, given the, like, full, like, because if it's a uh, red-green yellow scale, it's just, like, 100% yellow and then zero on all the other things. That's completely yellow. But if you're talking about yellow in some other sense, not a numerical description sense, then maybe completely yellow doesn't make sense anymore. So I'm saying that maybe this actually doesn't have to do with the adjective. Maybe it has to do with how we uh, are describing the adjective. 
we understand the adjective. So right here, I think there's a immediate problem. I don't think this is natural. This is the problem right here. It is natural to think. Why is it natural? Maybe we're imposing. So it's not natural. Okay. Some further data, while admittedly less straightforward, tends towards the categorization of justified in the absolute category. X is F, but Y is more F. -er. Sounds considerably more marginal for absolutes than for relatives. Thus, while X is tall, but Y is taller, is a very natural sounding everyday use of tall. X is flat, but Y is flatter, is a little more awkward sounding. Yeah, because flat usually means pretty flat. But again, what do you mean by flat in what context? We don't want to go so far as to say it is uninterpretably or totally, totally bizarre, merely that it sounds like a slightly more marginal or creative use of language. Again, whose use of language are we talking about here? Creative use of language. Maybe you're just boring users of language. Maybe that's your problem. And we can report that ordinary informants tend, tended to classify X as justified and Y as more justified as towards the marginal end. The tendency, what is it? Would they did they do some like experimental philosophy to get this? I mean, it, did they actually go research this? I don't know. I mean, I suspect they're right, but like, did they? I don't think so. The tendency of philosophers were more haphazard. Certain episodes, ah, here we go. See, once they start asking people, then they're just like, nah, the philosophers like, who knows? Certain epistemologists we asked were sufficiently imbued with the theory of how justification works as to find X is justified and Y is more justified to be completely straightforward. Yeah, this is what I'm thinking. Because they have taken away whatever, like, your conception of, like, pre- like pre-existing naturalness was, and they've got other theories. There are plenty of other theories, and this would probably make more sense on a relative justification scheme. For absolutes, the construction X is F but not completely F tends to be marginal in line with this. Her suspicion view belief that the stock market will crash is justified but not completely justified seems pretty marginal. I don't know, we got a lot of marginal people out there nowadays with marginal beliefs, and so it's like... I mean, you just change this from like the stock market. Her suspicion view belief that QAnon will rise to take over the country will is justified but not completely justified doesn't actually seem that marginal anymore given the subject matter because you could say look your belief in conspiracy theory is justified given like if you have been like stuck in like a conspiracy mindset for a while so you've got the justifications that is the whole point of the conspiracy theory is to give you enough like get you in thinking in a certain way but like once you, so the content, the semantics of the belief here, the issue again is this belief that the stock market will crash. This is a very normal thing. It's unusual though. But if you change this to something that has meaning in terms of justification, then all of a sudden you change the whole uh, tenor of the sentence and it stops becoming marginal anymore. Because you could say her belief in the, uh, conspiracy theory was justified but not completely justified because now you're cons criticizing the conspiracy theory all right and like I'm, I'm just ranting today but like uh feel free to ask questions about anything i'm talking about we're going over some epistemology mm -hmm. here Kennedy, 1999, notes that within the category of absolutes, there are two subcategories. Maximal absolutes are associated with the maximal, maximal degree of a scale. Meanwhile, minimals are associated with the pr property of having any positive degree whatsoever along a scale. Flat is a maximal. It tends to be associated with being maximally flat, while open is minimal. And any degree of openness counts as being open. Justified patterns more like a maximal. For example, minimal is not but not maximals combine felicity with slightly. But slightly justified is extremely awkward. Eh, depends who you're asking. Alvin Goldman includes slightly justified on his list of graded use of justified, but that does not all but that does not all, all comport with the habits of English speakers. Yeah, it's kind of um unusual, but again, did they do a uh, experimental philosophy study? So similarly, for maximal gradables, X is F, but could have been more F, is pretty marginal. Um, yeah, so X is flat, but could have been more flat, is pretty marginal. Yeah, I mean, again, depends what context you're in, but sure.
Kennedy notes that, for example, that X is straight but could have been made straighter is a bit odd. In line with this, the stockbroker was justified in thinking the stock market would crash but could have been more justified is also pretty marginal. Um, no, you can always get more information about the stock market. So I would think this is exactly the time when you could have said that. It's like you think the stock market would rise, but then some, but then the uh, is exactly how you get like housing crashes. Everyone thought it would keep going up, but they weren't completely justified. It's like that happened. This is exactly what happened. Granted, it's more rare than the usual case, but like these are exceptions that kind of prove that this is okay. All right, so they submit that the absolute features of justified should at least give one pause when it comes to the threshold model. Yeah, you should, but like that's not much of a conclusion. But that's okay. I mean, I'm, I agree. The, you should look at it maybe in terms of the maximal features, like kind of like flat. Like you're not really getting more flat once you're flat. But then if you stop thinking of it in that way, that's okay too. There's other ways to talk about it. All right, let me just talk about the writing here. Like I said, this is a strategic definition, this whole start. This is all setting up what they want you to believe, all of this. Like, they didn't actually admit anything other than their intuitions about how to do it. It's natural to think. There's all this stuff about how these things sound. I don't care. Like, your intuitions don't mean anything to me. Like, they just don't when it comes to epistemology. So... This is just them setting it up, and I'm actually mostly in agreement. Like, they're probably right with how people talk about this stuff, but that doesn't give you a philosophical, uh, that gives you no more of a philosophical justification than saying, hey, this is kind of how people have talked about this in the past. It's like, sure, okay, go ahead. But what's the conclusion you're going to draw off that? Like, that people have said something in the past? Okay. What's the metaphysics then? That justifies this well that's a different question okay so now we're going to move over to probability justification and probability <clears throat> as an instructive case study it is useful to see how problematic it is to try to model the behavior of justified using a probability scale the idea that degrees of justification are somehow a matter of epistem epistemic probability is certainly a common idea in the literature 12. To express the common view a little more precisely, the degree of justification for accepting the proposition H, given the evidence E, based on the background assumption B, is suppressed in the following discussion. Is the conditional prob probability of H given E or P H bar E? So yeah, this is standard stuff uh, like of uh, epistemic credence, you might say. Okay, how much do you believe something you give given the probability of H given the evidence E. And then you instead of uh, we're using justified, you, they tend to use a different uh, term, but like it doesn't really matter. It's pretty similar. The basic idea of such models is that one will have more justification to believe P than Q just in case that P is more probable than Q. This model can be developed in a way that models justified on tall so that X has justification to believe Q is to believe Q is justified in believing Q just in case P surpasses a probabilistic threshold set by context. But one might also be motivated by the considerations in the previous section to instead develop a, the model in such a way that justified gets associated with an endpoint on the probabilistic scale so that, strictly speaking, X is justified in believing P requires maximal probability. Well, that's just saying you're then you're going back to the quantized bit and you're not talking about probabilities, but you're talking about... Um, this is smart people acting like they're smarter than they are stuff. That's what philosophy is. Um, yeah, so basically what I do here, Brandy, and welcome, hi, how are you, is I'm reading papers and, I, and I'm in a grumpy mood, so I'm just like criticizing left and right. But mostly I usually try and figure out what the people are talking about and then see if it's like some good ideas in there. But at the moment, just this is making me grumpy, so I'm going to be grumpy. But feel free to ask questions and whatever. So it's like they're saying that like when you say you're justified about something and you say, well, you're like 80% justified. And then they're saying, well, no, you should be 100% justified. That's what this maximal probability is, just going to 100% justified, not 80% justified. But that's repeating what they said just above, like above. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So this is just saying like, look, how do we understand when we're justified? Yeah. 
But whichever way one goes, there are reasons to doubt that such a model is appropriate. One thing to realize, of course, is that this model can be at best, it be a model of how propositional justification for belief works. The literature dis distinguishes doxastic justification from propositional justification. justification. One can have great evidence for P, but one's belief in poor, one's belief be in poor standing. Hence, doxastically unjustified, because one's belief is not based on one's good evidence, but on bad argument instead. Yeah, so what you're saying is that your beliefs are unjustified, um, not the actual statement. So you can be, this is what I was saying earlier, you can be right or wrong, but for, you can be right or wrong about the proposition, but for the wrong reasons. Your beliefs are all funky. And so this is uh, actually what goes to the Gettier model, is that you can give yourself, you can look at different things in different ways, and you can be right for the wrong reasons, or wrong for the right reasons. So what you believe is unjustified. And that's actually what was happening happening in Gettier was when um, let's see you the classic example is look the person who will get the job has ten coins in their pocket but then it turns out everyone had ten coins in their pocket and so of course you were right but you were for, right for the wrong reason because you didn't know everyone had ten coins in their pocket and so your beliefs were unjustified your belief that ten, the person who would get the job was unjustified because you seemingly were always going to be right no matter what and your belief actually wasn't based on any knowledge about who was going to get the job <coughs> okay so bad argument and even more obviously, this model is not well suited to explaining degrees of justification for fear, concern, suspicion, suspending judgment, and so on. Additional justification for suspending judgment is not tantamount to additional epistemic probability. Distinguishing epistemic from non-epistemic uses of justified will not sidestep the issue. Degree of justification for suspending just judgment seems to be an epistemic issue. Yeah, you don't get away from epistemology no matter how much you try. Um, so yeah. Whatever, but yeah. So you, this is the whole point. You can, you have to separate out um, being right for the wrong reasons. But even focusing just on the case of justification to believe, there is good reason for doubting that degrees of justification correspond to degrees of likelihood. First, note that it is perfectly felicitous to say that an action or belief or emotion is not justified at all. And a natural hypothesis is that not justified at all signifies zero degree of justification. If degrees of justification correspond to epistemic probabilities, the natural hypothesis would be that belief in a certain proposition P is not justified at all in this case, in case its epistemic probability is zero. But that hypothesis is not borne out. One is not justified at all in believing that the coin will come up heads, but the epistemic probability of that outcome is in intermediate, not zero. This consideration is not decisive, however, for example, Excuse me. Perhaps being justified at all requires surpassing a threshold on the probability scale. So again, what they're saying here is basically, look, a lot of times when you're saying justified, it's like, well, it, you mean not justified at all, you mean probability zero, but if you're talking about what you believe, usually those probabilities are somewhere in between. You're not usually 100% convinced. Okay, but note second, and more decisively, that justified does not felicitously combine with numerical, for example, ratio and probability proportional modifiers like twice as 10% and so on. If justification was linked to a scale like probability that is friendly to numerical modifiers, then one would expect much more felicity than we do see. But again, this is a, um, this, this right here, it's like, yeah, you might be, depending on context, you might say, well, look, the gambler was justified it was like, you know, half justified in making their bet because that's what the numbers said. You could say a gambler was like that. Again, this is a special case, but that's okay. So what I think the authors are doing right here in the writing is they're narrowing down, actually, uses of justified. They're not explaining justified. They're describing the use of justified they want to talk about, which is a very different thing because... This isn't just justification, it's just talking about the kind of justification they like. And I don't mind them talking about the kind of justification they like, they're probably right about what they're talking about. But how wide, uh, how significant is this paper then? I, I find it just narrowing down in significance because they're not actually talking about justification 
uh, on the whole, they're just talking about what they like to talk about, which is okay too. But yeah, but that's how it, that's how this reads to me at the moment. They're defining away everything that they don't want to talk about. Okay, continuing. A comparison with being confident is somewhat illuminating here. Confident has notable similarities and differences with justified. Like justified, it seems to pattern like an absolute gradable. Completely confident is felicitous. Confident but not completely confident is marginal, marginal, and so on. Yeah, you could say they're like kind of confident but not like 100% confident. Um... And then again, what's the definition of confidence here? Because, you know, confidence a lot of times is just also used with uh, probabilities. And it's like, what's the confidence you have in that that bet? And you could say, well, I'm like 50% sure that the bet is a, a good bet. So. <coughs> Continuing. And I'm sorry I'm grumpy, but some days it happens. Moreover, there are analogous points to be made as regards not as regards not being justified at all and not being confident at all. Just as we can say a belief that a die will come up three is not justified at all, it is similarly natural to say that one is not confident at all that the die will come up three. But in this case, there's creden one's credence is far from zero. So, yeah, this is what I was just saying. This point is noted by Williamson. I know what MN means. Thus, the flat-footed idea that one is not confident at all is tantamount to zero credence is wrong-headed. Again, what do we mean by confidence here exactly? We it was not defined. Um Yeah. All right. So I mean, again, this just seems like well they're saying in some sense confidence is like what they want to talk about in some sense maybe not. I don't know. Yeah, and please ask questions. I'm just ranting. But in another respect, the behavior of confident is quite different to justified. And this is because even outside the philosophy room, numerical constructions combine felicitously with confident. Thus, it is not at all unnatural to say, I am three times more confident that the coin will come up heads than the die will come up three. And I am 50% confident that the coin will come up heads. This is what I was saying. Yay, I got something right. This creates a prima facie puzzle. How can it be that one can truly say, I have no confidence, I am not confident at all if she will win the bet, while also finding it natural to say, I am three times more confident that she will win the bet than the die will come up three? A few solutions suggest themselves. One view is that two quite different scales are in play in the context of each of the speeches, which have little to do with each other. Another, an, uh, excuse me. According to an alternative and arguably more plausible view, there is a single scale where being confident at all marks not an endpoint on the scale but a threshold. A natural first pass take on being confident at all is along the lines of being at all close to complete confidence. In a sense, this introduces a second scale, degrees of closeness to the max, but is highly parasitic on the original probability scale. It is worth noting in passing that similar at all data arises for other gradable absolutes. Thus, not being flat at all and not being dry at all do not plausibly equate to being maximally bumpy and wet. In those cases, a threshold approach naturally suggests itself and is natural to extend the threshold approach to confident. Okay, so basically they're saying, look, we've got multiple ways of describing these sorts of uh, great like things. It's like, yeah, sometimes there's a threshold, sometimes there isn't. It's like, okay, cool. <laughs> Like, that's cool. <laughs> but, like, again, cool. Like, so what? In short, the numericals make it much more natural to associate confident with something that has the structure of a probability scale that it is than it is, not that it is for justified. For confident, there is a reasonable prima facie case that at all marks a threshold on the scale corresponding to something like at all close to the max. Mm-hmm. That's cool. Like, um, but this is what I was saying a bit earlier, right here, that, um, let's highlight this. The numericals make it much more natural to associate. Okay? This is what I mean. We, the, the way you talk about different things in different contexts imposes, um, the scale. And so the, the concept of natural right here, like, what is the concept of natural? It's actually getting you, it's actually coming back to um how we are talking about it and so the fact that what you think is um natural has to do with how you end up talking about it means it is not inherent to the adjectives themselves 
that it's separable, that you can impose structure on these things, and therefore we're not talking about the concepts of confident and justified. Sometimes we're talking about imposing structure on it in the way we are speaking. And the idea that we're learning something about confident and justified, well, what we're learning is how they interact with the scales we are imposing on them. Now, granted, there's is there a difference between confident and justified? Sure, probably, I don't know. But like, what when is it okay to impose the different scales on this stuff? What are we learning in that point? Are we learning that it is when it is right to use the different scales? But like, what are we learning about justified then? If we're not actually getting the information from justified, we're getting the information about thresholds and things like that from the way we are talking about it that is imposed using uh, numerical scales or not, like probabilistic scales. So wh where's the fundamental, uh, where's, the, where's the philosophy here? Where is it? Hmm. Okay, continuing. Many philosophers will think that something has obviously gone wrong. On the picture presented, confident and completely confident is associated with the maximal end of the creedal scale so that completely confident is equivalent to subjective certainty. They will complain that it is obvious that one can be more completely confident in the ordinary sense without being certain, and even more and even more obvious that confident in the ordinary sense does not equate to certain certainty. But this is too quick. First, it is worth noting that in many languages, confident and certain get translated the same. Uh, so what? Anyway, thus in Latvian, both X is confident that P and X is certain that P are naturally translated as um, this thing which I can't read because I don't do Cyrillic, or I don't even know what this is. This is not Cyrillic, but I apologize on my lack of language skills. Similarly, Russian, both confident and certain, can be translated as this is the Cyrillic. Second, note that analogous issues arise for, for other gradable adjectives. A philosopher contrives a demanding sense of being empty of beer and then notes in, that in the ordinary sense of being completely empty can be truly ascribed to a beer glass in a pub, even though the glass is not empty in the demanding sense. There are well-known ways to approach this. One might say that the pub ascription is not strictly speaking true, but nevertheless felicitously assertable, and explain why. Or one might introduce a kind of contextualism according to which various scales are in play in context, and that certain tiny quantities of beer don't register on the scale in play at certain contexts. But third, we would... So, this is basically, okay, they're saying something's gone wrong and we don't know what? Alright, I guess I'll explain. But third, we should know... An extra complication. As Chris Kennedy notes, once we have a scale with a maximum and a minimum, adjectives often exhibit a degree of flexibility as to whether they gravitate toward a reading that means something like maximum or instead something like not minimum. He illustrates this for opaque and transparent. The antonyms opaque and transparent verify this prediction. According to the diagnostic discussed above, these these use a totally closed scale, completely slightly opaque transparent, and so are in principle compa compatible with either minimum or maximum standard interpretations in the positive form. The following examples show that which that both interpretations are in principle possible. Consider a context in which I am manipulating a device that changes the degree of tint of a car window from zero, completely transparent, to 100%, completely opaque. 67A can be felicitously uttered at the point at which I have almost reached 100% of tint, demonstrating both that opaque can have a maximum standard, I am denying that the glass is completely opaque, and that transparent can have a minimum standard, partial transparency. In 67A, glass is almost opaque, but not quite, still transparent. And B is the glass is almost transparent, but not quite, it is still opaque. Likewise, 67B can be used to describe the reverse situation, one in which I have dialed down to almost 0% of tint. Here, transparent has a maximum standard, complete transparency, and opaque has a minimum standard, partial opacity. And 14, for any closed scale adjective, a maximum standard interpretation entails a minimum one, but not vice versa. Assuming that stronger mean meanings are in general favored, this preference follows. If minimum standard interpretation were impossible, however, then the second sentence is 67AB would be contradictory. What we wish to point out is that once we have an at-all threshold, where everything under the threshold is not 
at all close to the maximum, then we have in effect a closed scale with a maximum at one end and the at all boundary at the lower end. And if Kennedy is right, then there is the prospect that confident may oscillate somewhere between maximal and minimal interpretations. This point generalizes. Insofar as justified at all and completely justified are associated with a closed scale, there is the prospect that justified may oscillate somewhere between maximal and minimal interpretation. We leave further exploration of this issue to another occasion. Okay, so again, what I think is going on here is we've got these scales, and they are, we can impose them at different points, and we use these words like justification and confidence at different times to represent these things. The authors are seemingly taking the they're ontologizing this. They're saying that's what justification is. I'm saying it's getting imposed and we're using justification to signal and how we talk about it to signal the scale. They seem to think that what's going on here is that, like right here, as you can see it, and I'm bringing this up is because confident may oscillate somewhat between the maximal and minimal interpretations. That the confidence itself has the property of oscillating between maximal interpretations. I'm saying, hey, look, I don't really care what word you're using. We impose maximal and minimal interpretations because of what they were saying about like glass tint. Like that's a normal sort of thing to say. So uh, like I don't, so I'm not seeing anything deep here. They think they're talking about the confidence and the justification. I'm seeing just like normal speech being uh, ontologized that they're taking a very significant ontological lesson that I don't think exists here. This is my gripes with epistemology. And I'm sorry, folks. <laughs> but I was like, I'm going to go stream. And I was like, this is a terrible idea, but I'm going to do it anyway. But like, yeah, please ask questions and uh, I'll be nicer to you than I am to the authors. <laughs> scale prim primacy and scale. You know what was funny? When I told like, uh, I know some people in philosophy, I told them like the first initial reaction when I told them what I was doing online on Twitch, they were like, okay, are you destroying people? I'm like, no, I'm trying to be as nice as possible. I'm trying to like explain like author's ideas and give them like principle of charity and like, you know, show the best of like what we can do and like, you know, what we understand. It's not going to always work. Um, but like, that was like my goal. <laughs> I was like, no, it's just that this paper is not quite clear with the examples. Um, you know, to be fair, I think this paper is actually okay with their examples as far as, like, compared to other philosophy papers. Um, you know, could their examples have been better? Maybe. But then again, I'm not being 100% uh, like charitable to them. And so it may be coming off that they're unclear. Philosophy... So, like, just to finish with De Marshall, it's that I, I think they're wrong, and therefore they may not be, I'm not giving them the best light. Now, I could be, like, you say, hey, look, let's give them the principle of charity here and say, look, we can say, hey, look, when we are describing things with adjectives, this is how adjectives are. And then I could have, like, gone from that perspective. I don't see any reason to do that. But, like, yeah, maybe they're... It, well, I mean, well, that's fair, De Marshall, but they should be giving clear... Uh, examples like the examples that they're giving like windows being tinted everyone should be able to explain that or understand that but see i think they're making too big of a jump so i think their philosophical jump is too big and there that's why it's coming off unclear because i don't think they've actually done the uh they've argued well enough for it <clears throat> philosophers are funny sometimes val poke says some think the only options are fighting people or ignoring them yeah 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 um, you have to throw elbows in academic philosophy because otherwise you're not going to make enough of a splash to get anything done or get yourself a, like, in a, like an appointment. So in some sense, it's a, it's a combat sport, uh, academia is. So either you ignore someone because they're not worth fighting or you fight someone who you think is going to be useful to fight. Uh, and that's just, like, the reality, I think, of academia in some sense. You have to, like, take down a big theory or a big philosopher, and that's how you uh, make a name for yourself. That's not what I was doing here. That's not what I'm normally doing when I read someone's paper. I'm trying to figure out what's going on and why are they saying this. Because 
the good philosophers, they, you know, they're trying to make a point. They think they're saying something, and you want to see what it is that they're saying. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's the question of like, what makes a good stream too? Like, should I be more grumpy on stream? I don't know. Ah. <laughs> <sighs> Okay, so, yeah, feel free to ask questions, but uh, thank you for your comments. Yeah, so, does grumpy review better than, like, charitable review? I'm not sure. Scale primacy and scale derivativeness. For some expressions, it is plausible that some grasp of a scale is integral to understanding them. For example, it is plausible that an understanding of heavy and tall requires some grasp of the scales of weight and have weight and height, respectively. But it is important to realize that even when scales are completely irrelevant to the understanding of a predicate, comparative use of the predicate can be introduced in a derivative way. Consider, for example, it is a feast. It is easy enough to get the hang of such constructions as... That meal was more of a feast than that one. One, particular, one particularly natural way to understand such claims is tantamount to that meal was closer to being a feast than the other one, where there is a rough and ready grasp of some scale of closeness. Of course, grasp of a closeness scale of this sort is hardly integral to one's grasp of it is a feast. Nevertheless, having mastered that predicate, one might often on the fly contrive some sense of comparative closeness to being a feast. Consider similarly circular. It is not plausible that mastering a circularity scale is integral to understanding being circular. But having mastered circular, it is not hard to contrive a rough and ready, ready scale of being close to being circular. The scales thus constructed will typically reflect some rough and ready sense of how close things are to the phenomena in question. Our ability to do this is quite general. The claim that this is more of an omelet than that, and she is more blameless than him, are perfectly interpretable. Each reflects the speaker's rough and ready sense of comparative closeness to being an omelet and being blameless, respectively. Okay. Yeah, you can impose scales. That's kind of my point. But you see how they, again, return to their being an omelet. Does anyone actually know what it is to be an omelet? Like, really? Like, that's a massive, like, being an omelet. How is it you're being an omelet? This is actually a nonsense. Like, really? This is like, if you take this out of context and I asked what being an omelet is, we can go into lots of metaphysics about what it is to be and to be an omelet. <laughs> uh, okay, anyway. Our general ability to introduce... I'm just griping on the same things. I don't have, think I have anything new to say about this, really. So I'm going to continue. But yeah, ask questions and uh, let me know if, uh, yeah, just let me know. Our general ability to introduce comparative structures along these lines should allay any suspicion that talk of degrees of justification is nonsense. Consider Jonathan Sutton, who thinks that a belief is justified if, and only if it is known. For me, the notion of a belief being more justified than another justified belief is, strictly speaking, nonsense. Knowledge does not come in degrees. This seems excessive. We have a general ability to contrive rough and ready scales of closeness to any given phenomenon and to use graded adjectives to express that scale. Yeah. Here we go. Finally getting somewhere. Contrive. The ability, general ability to contrive. Well, this is what I think is interesting right here. How do we contrive things? The charge of nonsense is thus unlikely to prove well-founded. But some interesting questions remain. A better question of a better question than whether graded use of justified expresses sense or nonsense is the question of whether such uses are derivative in the way being more of a feast is. On one picture, the non-graded notion of justified is primary and the graded use highly derivative. On this picture, the basic semantics of justified does not associate it with a scale, but we can nevertheless coerce a scalar use out of it by using general linguistic mechanisms that allow us to generate a scalar use out of expressions that do not get associated with a scale via our foundational understanding of them. Your foundational, not ours. Your foundational uh, understanding of them. See, if you buy their thing, then yes, you have to like use a scalar, uh, you have to coerce the scale out onto it. If you do not accept the foundational thing, then this is less of a coercion, this is just how we do. 
On a second picture, some kind of scale is integral to understanding justified. Call the latter view a scale fundamental view of justified and the former a scale derivative view. Which view is correct? A second question is also worth addressing. Is there anything of potential significance to philosophers that may be at stake here? We shall address each question in turn. Topical, what's up? Just got here. Is the scale discussed in mathematical measurement terms or just playing with English? Um, they talk about both. They're talking about relative things in terms of like getting close to being like kind of justified. So you could say something like that, like something is kind of justified. And you could also give it like a probability. It's like 30% justified. So they're talk talking about both. And finally, they're saying a scale fundamental view. I can already tell you that they're going to beg the question against the scale fundamental view by the entire way they've set up this paper, like right here. But um, I'm saying that you can impose scales and they're saying scale derivative that you have a like and the scale like the coerce <laughs> the scale onto it but yeah so this is a question of how do you uh how do you understand understand things that can be graded like more yellow less yellow or you could say like this shirt is yellow and then you could look at the like color codes and you're saying well this has got 10 percent more yellow uh in it like given like the like pink ratios or whatever you're using or like html codes okay we do not uh, continue and yeah please ask questions tropical um everyone it's always nice to uh be able to explain this in a different way because i don't think of uh, i think of what i think of you think of what you think of and that's cool continuing we don't propose to offer a definitive verdict on whether justified is scale derivative or not oh but we would like to present two interesting lines of thought that militate in the direction of scale derivativeness. One line of thought worth drawing attention to is presented in Burnett's comprehensive treatment of gradable expressions. There she focuses on what she calls a paradox of absolute adjectives. The paradox can be usefully represented as an apparent inconsistent triad. Absolute adjectives are gradable. Gradability is derived from context-dependent sensitivity to comparison classes, but the semantic denotation of absolute adjectives has nothing to do with comparison classes. All right, let me get to Tropical Geek. That is perception versus sensation, and measurement is how those are mathematically separated. Perception and sensation are not in the same continuum. Um... Yeah, but you can do things, um, yeah, it sounds like that, you know, you can, depending on, like, your philosophical, um, predilections, what you like, you can ontologize, is kind of how I'm calling it, you can say this is how things are in the world, that it, the perception is actually, things are more yellow, okay, and then the sensation is like, uh, yeah, so, like what you perceive and like what the actual mathematical uh, interpretation is like the, that, like uh, the wavelength coming off my shirt and going through the camera and out into you through your screen. Um, and you can then measure those numbers. Again, it depends on how you are measuring them. Like you do not need to measure them with math. You can measure them with other things. And so in some sense, it's still a choice of how to do it. And yes, they're not in the same continua, but it's not just two. It's like a million different ways of doing it. And you can break it down to make it in a mathematical sense. And then you can have like the relative things, but that's not the only way to do it. Yeah. So independent reality versus perception. But again, th I, I find this, uh, what do you mean by independent reality here and perception? You can, again, break this down in m multiple ways. And when you do it in multiple ways, you might be able to, you know, re-import the mathematical on one side or re-import, like, relative, like, concepts on the other. And so I don't find that, um, like, I understand what you guys are saying. You guys are bringing, um, like, a good distinction here that the quantization of a, a property like what's the quantity of yellow in the wavelengths um coming off the shirt is different from just saying well it's more yellow or yes yellow, yellow as it appears to my eyes um so but where is that because either way could be the more yellow or yes yellow could still be in the shirt versus like the wavelengths so yeah so this paper's trying to link the justified to a scale and type of scale that's right They're, that's exactly what's going on Okay, but like, we're <clears throat> so this person here is saying, look, 
So like the fact that absolute adjectives are gradable. So that means they are like there's like you can give a percentage on them and then it's context dependent sensitivity to comparison classes. This is what you guys are saying about perception. It's context dependent on how you're perceiving it to something else. And but then the third one is that the semantic denotation, the meaning that would be of absolute adjectives has nothing to do like the actual meaning of yellow has nothing to do with what you are comparing it to in your head. Like you're talking about the math there. So this is one way of cashing out this sort of paradox. They're saying, look, you can have the different like relative colors, but that doesn't actually uh, matter when you're comparing the actual reality of the number of like the wavelengths of the yellow. <coughs> All right. Burnett in effect says the triad is not, not inconsistent. The semantic den- denotation... A- of absolute adjectives does not have great ability associated with their de- denotations. Okay, so it does the semantics does not have a great ability. What I thought was yeah, so it has nothing to do with it. But I thought that was the whole point was that they were gonna uh, cause problems. So nevertheless, we can stretch the meaning of the relevant adjectives in order to coerce a great. Ah, uh, this is what I was saying. You can force it back in. This is what they're doing. They're saying, hey, look, even though the relative and the absolute don't match up, they're saying, hey, you can force this back in. And this is what they're saying here, right? 16 and 16. I will show that through giving an appropriate tolerant and strict semantics for AA absolute adjectives, we can arrive at an understanding of how it is possible to stretch the meaning of an absolute term to take in the great ability gamut of reality. So this is, again, you're going to force the uh, wavelength numbers to come back into reality, even if we were saying more yellow or yes, less yellow. In short, three is correct, but that does not deprive absolute adjectives of a gradable use since it is the coerced stretched meaning that is responsible for such a use. Two can be preserved alongside one by insisting that the stretched meaning involves sensitivity to comparison classes, that it is this stretched meaning that accounts for one. So they're forcing us to use one single um, gradable use of absolute adjectives into the numerical thing, and then you get the problems. Again, I'm just going to resist this by saying, look, you're, you guys are picking and choosing which one you want to say is the best, and then that's not, you don't have to do that. Okay, this is not the place to rehearse Burnett's admirably detailed case for her picture of absolute adjectives. What bears emphasis in this context is that her treatment entails that all absolute adjectives are scale derivative. Within her framework, the fact that justified as absolute is a decision reason for cl- decisive reason for classifying it as a scale derivative. And now let me... <laughs> I considered doing this earlier. But it's just like, it is, this is driving me a little nuts. The fact that they talked about like more circular or less circu- circular. Uh, to- Tropical Geek says, in measurement, you can measure both the adjective and the numerical radi- gradients and match them or not. Yes, this is what I'm saying. It says you're st- they ha- are forcing you into the numerical gradients here, but there is no necessity to do this without begging the question. And that's where the or not is really important right here. You don't have to do this. You can. But like, what is the philosophical justification for doing it? And what I was just about to say is, this is why I'm, I said earlier that they're going to beg the question about, eh, I don't mind typos. Typos are fine as long as I know what you mean. I was like, I don't care about your grammar as long as you made sense. Like, if you don't make sense, then I'm like, well, what? But if I understand typos and I understand grammar, it doesn't matter. I'm not going to get all angry about that. <clears throat> but what I was just saying is you have to have begged the question in a certain way to get this answer because you're going to call the gradable, um, numerical gradables more fundamental. And I was going to say, when you, they were talking about the circul- circular thing up here, I was going to be like, I guarantee you they're going to make the mistake of having a circular argument. And uh, if I was writing the review, I would have made it very snarky, and then I would have said, hey, look, this is still circular here, and then you didn't really understand circular arguments, you didn't grade it, and then I would have crossed it out because that would have been mean, and I wouldn't have said that in a review because that's mean and there's no need for that. You could just say, hey, look, you are got a problem with this argument. <coughs> circular arguments, and there, this is like... I would say this is just a little bit circular, this argument. <laughs> uh, okay, so <clears throat> while they think this is a decisive reason for classifying a scale derivative, I do not. I see it as begging the question. 
Okay, continuing. Here is a second prima facie reason for thinking that justified is a scale derivative. It is tempting to think tempting for who? Tempting to think that justified has a strong affinity with such normative concepts as that of permissibility and blamelessness. Circular like an op exactly. Exactly, tropical geek. This is a theme permissibility and blamelessness. This is a theme of work in progress by one of us. It is also a theme of some interesting literature on justification. For example, better distinguishes strong necessity modals like must from weak necessity modals like ought, arguing that justification functions as the dual of a weak necessity modal, where the semantic value of that dual is appropriately glossed as faultlessness. Here is not the place to defend views of this kind, but it is worth noting out, worth pointing out that if they are right, that may help the case in favor of the scale derivative view. After all, greater uses of faultlessness that was more faultless than that, or of permissibility that was more permissible than that, seem to be fairly paradigmatic cases of coerced scale derivative use of adjectives. Well, that's nice, but I have no idea what your other work is, so I can't actually judge your argument, You're just hand waving to other stuff. Okay. So much for our first, like, this is the literal hand wave, like, go look at something else. But yeah, so much for our first question, what of our second? Is there anything of philosophical interest at stake when it comes to scale fundamental fundamentality or scale derivativeness? Here we wish to make two observations. Um, yeah, I mean, so they've already concluded that scale derivativeness is more fundamental, and now they're saying, well, what's philosophically interesting about that? First, in cases of adjectives for which graded uses are scale derivative, we should be skeptical of any kind of conceptual analysis of that adjective or the concept associated with it that appeals to a scale, at least insofar as the project of conceptual analysis is supposed to make vivid what our basic understanding of the adjective consists in. After all, if the adjective is scale derivative, then associations with a scale would appear to be a secondary coerced phenomenon and peripheral to the basic understanding of a term. This raises an additional prima facie concern to the one raised earlier about such analyses in the literature as Olson's gloss on bonjour's at least on bonjour, at least insofar as such claims are offering any in anything like the spirit of a conceptual analysis. Nine, a belief system is justified if it is coherent to a sufficiently high degree. All right, so basically they're saying, yeah, well, all the things that the other people are saying are bad if you accept our model, but of course. Our second observation is that in many cases, scale derivativeness brings with it a significant variability in the scale associated with graded comparative adjectives, and there may be good reason to expect such variability in the case of the graded use of justified action and justified belief. Let us elaborate. When it comes to coerced scale derivative uses, there will be no guidance concerning which scale to deploy that emanates directly from the initial semantical denotation, since that semantical denotation does not encode a scale. In some cases, however, there will be a salient natural way to construct a scale on the fly. When this is the case, we might expect quite a bit of constancy in the way a scale is generated from the context from context to context, but when this is not the case, we should expect quite a bit of unruliness in the behavior of graded use from conversation to conversation. Let us begin with an illustration of the former, more disciplined pattern. Suppose we think of permissible credences in a proposition as forming a sub-range of the standard credence scale. Perhaps for some p it is in the range of 0.2 to 0.3. Then there is an overwhelmingly natural way of associating a scale with credence x is more permiss permissible than credence y. We treat the credences in the permissible range as completely permissible and then rank individual credences outside the range as more or less permissible according to how close they are to the range. Because of the naturalness of this way of doing things, it would take a fair bit of effort to reimagine a context where we say the credences that are completely permissible are 0 0.2 to 0 0.3, but the credence 0.4 is more permissible than 0.32. Um, sure. So if you're like, again, this is just sort of appealing to like what you, uh, this is appealing to context to say, hey, look, if you, you we have something that sort of makes sense to begin with, well, we can stick with that. That's fine. The Creedence case is relatively special, however. For many coerced uses, there is no particularly salient natural scale to turn to when contriving a scale. You see, there's 
use this use of salient natural here. I mean, yeah, if if it's obvious what's going on, that's obvious and fine. But when it's not obvious and fine, then you've got problems. And whichever scale is constructed on the fly will be highly sensitive to the goals and background of of the conversation in which the coerced which the coerced use is in play. Consider, for example, X is more of a feast than Y. There are various parameters that might be brought into play. The variety of food involved, the quantity of food involved, the fanciness of the food involved, or something vague weighing weighting or some vague weighting of or of some or all of these factors. By contrast with permissible credence, we would expect significant variability in the coerced scales. Yeah, so when there's nothing clear, it's like, well, it's not clear. What if justified as applied to either actions or belief? Here again, analogies with permissions or faultlessness may be instructive. Is there a salient natural way of ranking actions that are not faultless as a more or less faultless, or of ranking actions that are not permissible as more or less permissible? As far as we can tell, the situation seems rather more like that of a feast than that of permissible credence. One might contrive a rough and ready way of counting faults and then rank actions as more or less faultless depending on the number of faults. Or one might contrive a rough and ready way of weighing seriousness of faults and count actions as more or less faultless dependent on the seriousness scale. Or one might contrive a rough and ready way of ranking how aware people were of the fact that the, that were at fault and use that. But there doesn't seem to be a very salient and natural scale to gravitate to. I mean, I don't know what this... I'm like, I'm trying to figure out what they think their point is here. So they've got this big footnote after all this. But let me just finish up this paragraph and maybe I can think about it. As far as we can see, while there may be a salient scale for permissible credence, the situation for permissible and or faultless belief seems to be rather like that of permission, permissible and or faultless action. Among beliefs that are at fault, epistemically speaking, how do we rank them for being more or less faultless? It would, after all, be a bit naive to think that we can grade on a scale of probability on the evidence. After all, it is a familiar point that beliefs were w- beliefs well supported by the evidence may nevertheless be formed by imperfect means. Furthermore, we have seen that graded uses of justified belief do not play with numericals in the way one might expect if it were associated with a probability scale. Moreover, those of us who are happy to think that a belief can be knowledge without being based on evidence might think that an evidentially unsupported belief that is not knowledge might nevertheless in some sense count as being close to being justified simpliciter on account of there being a nearby situation where the same method produces knowledge. Our suspicion, then, is that there may not be any natural scale to turn to when gravitate, when generating a coerced meaning for that belief is more justified than that. And if that is right, we should place graded use of justified in the highly variable category. So, this is finishing up right here. Grade on a scale of probability is measurement, which requires reliability and validity tests. Yeah. So the thing about what they're saying here is that when it require which requires requ- reliability and validity test tropical geek clearly some things well what they're saying is you just don't know the times when you know when you can have reliability and validity tests those are the good times when we know what's going on all the times when we don't know about that and you start imp- imposing like reliability and validity tests and all whatever other tests then it becomes ad hoc you're just doing stuff because you're like well this seems like a good idea at the time and so they're saying all the times when you know it's good and all the times when you don't know you don't know so that's kind of what they're saying this is them starting the hedge your bets here that they don't know when you can actually make the distinction that you want to with what kind of scale you need to use i think that's what's going on so juggling English, there's some of that, but they're trying to say, look, it's context sensitive and then we just don't know. But let me get through the last uh, paragraph and then we can discuss. If graded use of justified are both scale derivative and rather unruly, this can serve as a partial vindication of what has gone on in epistemology. <coughs> Epistemologists have for the most part tended to say a lot about what it takes for a belief to be justified and have said very little about graded justification. If the graded uses are scale derivative, then it is best ignored 
it is best to ignore graded uses when providing an account of justification simplicity. And if the graded uses are unruly, displaying significant variation in content from con conversation to conversation, then there, be may, then there may be little gained by tackling a general question of the form, what is it for a belief to be more justified than another? Perhaps epistemologists can proceed as they were without undue concern. So, okay. So, basically they're saying, look, this is really good to know, but we're not 100% sure that the state of epistemology at the moment right here, um, what is concerning in epistemology has not been this sort of stuff. And what they're saying is, well, we should be concerned with this other sort of thing. This is like their program here. And that the reason no one looked at it is because it seems like, well, there's all these other problems that are going on, but they think they've got like something good to talk about. And that's kind of what's happening. They're saying, look, there's all these problems, but, and it's getting ignored because of like the problems, but like they're trying to say, hey, this is still cool stuff. And uh, we identified a good area of like a, like the non unruly sort of area that is a pretty good thing to know about. And so that's like their positive contribution here is when you're not talking about the unruly stuff and you don't know, then you're saying, hey, look, we've got a nice area of uh, research that we can focus on and, you know, make some hay. That's that's their point in this whole last section. They're hedging their bets, but then they're saying, but there's still the idea is that there's still something that is good when you're like up here, like this stuff up here, when you're saying we can have a good way of understanding what's going on with these relative things. So all of this is like what they wanted to get to. <sighs> yeah. So questions, questions. Um, I mean, epistemology makes me grumpy. This paper made me grumpy. I was already grumpy. Um, somewhat apologetic about that, but not too apologetic. Um, I am clearly not in agreement with the under their claim that this is derivative. That wow, okay. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, you can that the derivative claim that we're not that the in position of scale, it has something to do with the adjective themselves, that there's something Im inherently uh, philosophically to be known uh, in the way in like justification and uh, like confidence and something like that. The uses of justified are scale derivative. We're not Im scale imposed, not scale imposed, as I was saying, but I don't see that at all. And so I find their. Um, you know, it's fine. It's like they still identified an interesting area to talk about. I just would talk about it completely differently. So, let's see. What else do we have to talk about in this paper? <sighs> I don't know. You know, it's like if you buy this version of the world, like this is fine, and then you can go like jump on like this sort of interesting stuff they're talking about. It's like, I'm not in their tradition, and so I'm like, I'm just not... Like, to be fair, like, this was reason... Nah. How was this argued? Let's talk about that for a minute. How was this paper argued? So you're saying it have a good shot or look later in academia. Um... This sort of thing has actually, I mean, this is in a top journal, very top journal. This is, in some sense, I don't know if this is a popular topic. I haven't seen a whole lot on this, but I mean, they were saying um, is underexplored by epistemologists. So this is not really a, this is, they're saying, hey, look, we've got something new here to talk about. So, in some sense, how are they arguing for this? And this is kind of on your question to Marshall. <laughs> well, I wouldn't bother. Just avoid epistemology in general. Um, epistemology is a pain in the butt. 
Um, what they're saying is, hey, look, we can look at these graded things, like in, in sense of uh, adjectives that you can say, like partials, and they're saying there's hay to be made here, there's something to be learned. And they're probably right about that. I just don't think they've got the right perspective on it. But like, this is in the top journal, and I was going to say well-argued. I'm going to say it is well-argued. I just disagree with everything that they argued. And I don't like the way they argued for it, but that doesn't mean it wasn't well-argued for. So the fact that it is well-argued for just means I'm like... Because you can't say it was poorly argued. It was argued fine in some sense. Um, so what they did was they set it up to show that we haven't talked about something and in in epistemology and philosophy and they're saying hey look this is a big area and we talk about this a lot and so we're gonna say how do we actually go about this and if they had gone in and said hey look let's just go look at how we go about this and not saying this uh, other stuff about uh derivativeness i would have been like completely like all right well whatever that's cool but like what they're saying is that um they tried to make the further philosophical claim. And they did that by saying, hey, look, here's how they set up the problem. Here's all the examples. And then they gave their spin on it. And by setting it up in a certain way and giving their spin on it, they got to their conclusion that um, that degrees are, are derivative in terms of scale. Scale is derivative in terms of uh, it's coming from the adjective, not imposed upon it. And... Uh, that we have not looked enough at the adjectives themselves and their like their scale ontology. So, but that's how they set this up. You have to understand what did they do? They said, "Look, we have all these examples. We have evidence from linguistics. We have evidence from philosophy, and this is all pointing towards the this new area in epistemology. And that's why, um, you know, this is." A good paper in an excellent journal. So, and that's probably, uh, you know, what like the reviewer said. It's like this is uh, like opening up a new area of epistemology, and it's like well argued for, and you know they drew from different areas, and yeah, and that's how I imagine the reviews went on this paper. So like. There's a reason it got published, and it published well. It was nice. The problems with it... You like the topic... I mean, I love epistemology. It just drives me crazy, because I just find that there was issues with this that um, like it just completely glossed over from the get-go. And in some sense, that is... I don't think they did it strategically. I think that's just how they see the world. And so when they every time they said natural here, it's like, well, that's how you see it. Salient natural. I don't I didn't highlight all of them, but it's like every time they said stuff like that. Now you need another review. <laughs> like something is tempting to think, like that just is another way of saying it's natural to think. Our foundational understanding, no, yours. So these are all loaded terms here. And this was all loaded in a certain way to get you to think these people are very smart and they're doing this on purpose to, you know, get you to go along with them in how they're seeing the world. And, you know, you have to resist that if you want to, if, like, you're interested in this sort of topic. Yeah, I could do another paper. Um, I might take a, a minute or two break. I have to run to the bathroom and, you know, get more to drink. But I will be right back with another paper after this. So, I mean, let me know uh, if you got any more questions. And uh, otherwise, I'll, I'll be I'll BRB. We won't do any more epistemology. <laughs> okay, I will BRB and... Uh, yeah, so 